Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series. Um, so the uh, webinar series is hosted by myself, uh, Melinda Ellison, University of Idaho Extension Sheep Specialist. Also Carmen Wilmore, University of Idaho Extension Educator for Lincoln County in Idaho, as well as Whit Stewart, who is the University of Wyoming Extension Sheep Specialist. And we bring this webinar to you all uh, once a week on Thursdays. Um, as we move forward, uh, make sure that you're following our Facebook uh, um, at UI Sheep and Goats and the University of Wyoming Sheep page is uh, UW Sheep. Also, if you want to look at any of the webinars that we've had in the past and any coming up, um, we'll be posting them to our YouTube channel the University of Idaho Extension Livestock Channel. So make sure you check those out. Um, today, I'm gonna be discussing with you guys uh, biosecurity and disease management for sheep and goats. This is a talk that I gave about a month ago at the um, Idaho Wool Growers Summer Meeting with the Idaho Cattle Association. And um, I had a request to go ahead and give this talk again so that we could share with more people and get it up on the YouTube channel. So um, here's this. So biosecurity obviously with sheep is very important. Sheep and goats, I apologize, um, is very important because these critters have more um, infectious diseases than any other livestock species. Maybe not uh, pigs, but <laughs> um, at the end of the day, most of the things that sheep and goats can be infected with are also zoonotic meaning that they can be transferred to humans. And so it's really important to make sure that within your herd and your flock that you are um, making sure that you're sort of avoiding and doing your best to not get diseases within the, the herd. So um, I wanna get started just by talking about what are the basics and I apologize, this talk was made at the beginning for sheep. And so sometimes I'm going to bloop up and not have goats, but this is um, going to be similar for sheep and goats. So uh, what do we need? Basic quality of life for sheep and goats. We have to have good air quality. Um, we need to have quality and quantity of water, making sure the animals have good quality water all the time available to them. Um, at any given moment. We need to make sure that the feed that we're giving them is of good quality, free of any sort of dust, mold, other things that could get in there, um, rodent feces, that kind of thing. Um, making sure that you have adequate nutrients. I will continually say this to you all, but uh, nutrient quality and quantity in your animals is the primary thing that can help you avoid most of the things that can happen to your animals. If you're feeding them right and you're feeding them um, good quality feeds, you're going to avoid a lot of issues with the animals. Um, housing is also important. You want to make sure that they're protected from any kind of weather, predators. If you can avoid insects, if you can avoid exposure to disease and give them space that they need so they can do normal social interactions and, and minimize the disturbances they have, get exercise, um, that type of thing. So you want to, when it comes to housing, give them the best physical and social um, capabilities as well as just quality and protection. The other thing as we go into um, a conversation about disease management is knowing what a healthy animal looks like. So adult sheep and goats should range anywhere from 102 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit for rectal temperature. And the kids and lambs are gonna range a little bit more. So you can expect them to be around 101 to 104. Um, respiration should be about 10 to 20 breaths a minute. Heart rate, um, 70 to 90 beats per minute. Uh, fecal production, uh, adult animals should range from six to 10 pounds of fecal production a day. And when you get in those younger animals that are maybe being fed grain, you might see approximately four pounds per day because they're going to produce less uh, feces eating a, a higher energy diet. 
And you want to understand what normal behavior is and any time that you can reduce stress, that's the ticket. So some of the things that I have on hand just purely to make sure that my animals are healthy and if I see any sort of changes in behavior, um, I have my stethoscope so I can hear the respiratory rate and the heart rate, um, a thermometer so you can take rectal temperature and as we go forward, anytime that you can put on gloves and protective equipment, it's really important because almost everything that the animals can get, you can also get. And we'll go into some of those in detail as we move forward, but I'm going to keep hitting on that because sometimes it's easy to just walk out barehanded and take a temperature and then not wash your hands or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you have whatever they had. So the objectives when you're developing an infectious disease control program are to enhance an animal's ability to resist infection and you want to minimize the chances of exposure. So you want to lower the infectious disease that is being carried by the adults because especially when you're lambing and kidding, this is when transmission can occur to the offspring. And a lot of times the young animals can't handle the disease the same way that the adults can. You want to minimize uh, buildup of diseases in animals and environment, and you want to isolate any diseased animals from the flock. This is a planning wheel that I found that um, really identifies all the different things that you have to think about when you're doing when you're planning an, an infectious disease control program. And of course, most of these things are going to play a role in other areas of planning as well, but absolutely having a good understanding of all these different areas of your production is gonna assist you in being able to make sure that your infectious disease control program is effective as well. And you guys can go back and look at this in more detail once I post it on the YouTube channel. <clears throat> so there are a handful of principles of biosecurity. So the primary thing to remember is that for disease, it's easier to keep it out than it is to eliminate it. So once you have it, it's going to be way more challenging than upfront just trying to make sure that you don't get it. So number one, you want to identify where your animals are coming from and what their biosecurity program is, their infectious disease control program. And you want to make sure that whatever animals you're purchasing are clean when they come into your, um, your production system. When you get new animals and when any animal comes down sick, you want to make sure you quarantine them. You develop vaccine and parasite control programs because that's preventative. Develop treatment protocols. So if you do come down with disease, what are you going to do about it? develop a culling carcass disposal and necropsy protocol, which we'll get into. You have to have also a disinfection and sterilization protocol because the equipment that you use is uh, one of the primary um, ways that disease and infection get into your, into your herd. You want to evaluate your nutritional requirements across all the different life stages and adjust your feeding um, to each of those different stages throughout the year and across years. You wanna minimize stress on the animals as much as possible. And of course, at the end of the day, keep records. That's really important for remembering what has happened, being able to identify what the problem is when it occurs, treatment records, et cetera. And we'll get more into that as well. So one of the things I recommend when you're um, working on some of these protocols that you might uh, have in your in your system is that you develop a veterinary client patient relationship and I know that that's hard in a lot of areas. Um, small ruminant vets are not common and most vets don't like working on small ruminants and so I understand that it's a challenge but if you can develop that relationship with your veterinarian it's going to help immensely when it comes to all of these things. Um, so in Idaho, and it changes from state to state, that, that veterinary client patient relationship means that your vet has to visit your farm every 12 months. And that 
relationship that you develop with your vet will allow you to be able to potentially get off-site prescriptions. Maybe your vet will take a text or a phone call to help you identify some problems rather than having to come to your farm. Um, they can assist you with testing, et cetera. All of these things are things that the vet will do for you if you have that relationship. If you don't have that relationship, you can pretty much count on none of those things being available to you. They can also help you develop the different types of protocols and programs within your herd. So developing that infectious disease control program, helping you with your herd health protocols, helping you with your nutrition and management plans. Um, there's obviously other people out there that can help you with all these things, but it's, a, it's really important to have your vet be a part of it. Additionally, you guys have all heard about the veterinary feed directive where uh, many of the antimicrobials are, um, ha they have to be prescribed from a licensed veterinarian. And as we go th into the next couple of years, they're going to be adding more to that list. And so things that right now are easy to get, uh, tetracycline and penicillin are going to be part of that VFD list. And so just your simple penicillin, you're going to have to have that relationship with your vet to get. And so I would recommend starting to work on that relationship now and it never hurts to have somebody um, with a medical degree take a look at your animals every now and again because there's things that you may miss that they might catch. So um, just a little bit of a soapbox there, but it's really important even if they're not small ruminant specialty vets. So as far as sourcing animals, when you go to purchase animals, there's a couple of options um, that you can usually fine. So one would be a closed flock, meaning that no outside animals have come into that flock in three or more years. A high health flock means that they have that infectious disease um, control program in effect in their flock or herd and they monitor for diseases regularly. They have records, they have um, testing that's been done. And so you can be pretty confident in receiving those animals or you can get them from a high risk flock, which I would say is primarily what I see in Idaho. Um, not, I mean, not to talk down on anybody, but it's just one of those things that a lot of people don't think about. And so um, it's really important to ask for proof of testing if you're um, wanting to make sure that you're not bringing diseases into your, into your um, herd by just purchasing other animals. And again, when you get those new animals, you want to isolate them for a while or if something in your flock comes down sick. So what quarantine means is you separate them from the other animals where there's no ability for them to even touch noses. Keep them apart for three to four weeks. This is the time period when you can treat any illness that you see, get the testing done that you might want to get done that you may have not asked for when you brought new animals into your uh, system. You can vaccinate them at this time, give them some dewormer. Um, most protocols for dewormers is treat and then wait four to six weeks and treat again. So um, keep that in mind. One of the big things with dewormers, um, worms coming from somewhere else will live in your flock forever. And so it's really important to try to keep out any of those internal parasites that you might get. External parasites, while not deadly in most cases, are a pain in the hiney, and so I would recommend also treating for those. You want to trim their feet if needed and inspect for any sort of disease in their feet. Maybe a foot bath is appropriate during this time period. Um, and you also want to be aware of all the possible contaminants as you're moving between your herd, your quarantine herd, your sick animals, etc. All of the things that can be sharing disease include feed, water, salt and mineral, bedding. It can live in the soil in a lot of cases, your fence rails. If you're walking out there with your boots on or you have um, a pair of coveralls that you wear, your trailer, if you're shearing the sheep, um, anytime that you use other equipment health-wise, uh, health esophageal tubes, syringes, etc., Make sure you're not sharing those across animals and and as we go through we're going to talk about disinfecting and sterilizing so make sure that you do that on everything that is reasonable as well 
A vaccination protocol is really important because there's a lot of things that can be infectious in sheep and goats that can be vaccinated for. And so especially if you have that um, type of thing in your herd already, or if you're trying to avoid getting something the neighbor has or whatever it is, this is where you set up a vaccination protocol. You want to use vaccines regularly as labeled and you want to make sure that you're storing them properly. So one of the things that happens all the time is that your fridge out in the garage or out in the barn may not maintain temperature like it should. And so your vaccines are no longer um, effective. And so you want to really make sure that those things are um, working properly. And so you're storing your vaccines the way that they should be. Most of the time with vaccines, the benefit outweighs the drawbacks. And so um, it's important to, to have that protocol. The biggest thing to think about though, is if you have sheep that are sickly, skinny, not looking very good, vaccines are not effective if the animal is not healthy. So that's an important thing to notice as well. So um, I typically uh, recommend that all animals get some kind of a clostridial and tetanus vaccine, so CD&T or an eight-way regardless of where you are or what you have in your, in your uh, herd, I would recommend at least hitting them with one or the other of those two. Um, and then it's gonna be farm specific from there. So maybe um, you have foot rot prevalently in your flock or maybe your neighbor does or whatever it is that you wanna protect your animals against, that's when you add those to your vaccination program. Um, you also want to develop a management plan that works hand in hand with your vaccine program. And so these are all things that you can work with your veterinarian or somebody like myself to make sure that you're doing what you need to do for your herd. Internal parasite control program, like I said, it's really important to um, at least be aware of what type of internal parasites you have in your area. Uh, it's very farm specific farm and area specific. So depending on the type of parasite is how you'll uh, develop that internal parasite control program. So one of the ways to understand what your internal parasites look like is through fecal testing. So that gives you um, an idea of what the actual parasite load is for your animals and what specific parasite it is. Um, you want to test before and after deworming so that you understand whether or not your dewormer is effective. And you want to provide a dewormer or an anthelmintic that is effective against at least 90% of the worms that are present in your animals or else it's probably not worth it. Um, so another thing to think about with parasites, especially in sheep, is that we're starting to see some parasite resistance to anthelmintics. And so um, one of the things that you can do is, is work on that internal parasite control program to where you're targeting um, maybe 75% of the flock is one of the options that I've heard from veterinarians. The other one is to do the FAMACHA scoring, which is um, identifying animals that um, are pale in the, mem in the mucous membranes, which tells you uh, that the animals may or may, they may have a worm problem. So you also want to, and we are actually later this summer going to be providing a FAMACHA scoring um, training. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you stick with us for, uh, I think that's going to be in early September. Um, the other thing is to make sure that you're checking effectiveness of the dewormer regularly. There's really no point in giving it to the animals if it's not going to do anything for them. The other thing that you can do is grazing management. So um, the majority of internal parasites will live on the lower four inches of plants, grasses. So if you can leave at least four inches or maybe more at the end of grazing and rest the pasture for four to six weeks, um, you'll hopefully be able to 
cycle out. That's the, the length of the cycle of the worms. And so you can um, hopefully come back to a clean pasture when you come back. And the other alternative is to um, co-species graze. And so for example, if you graze cattle first, they pick up some of the parasites that your sheep and goats may pick up. Um, and then that would leave your sheep and goats to graze some of the uh, forbs and, and weedier species that your cattle won't eat. Um, and the other thing is, is if you have animals that never need dewormed, they always score well uh, with the famacha, they in their fecal test don't ever have a parasite load. Those are the animals that you want to keep in your herd um, as you move forward into breeding. So you can definitely select for some resistance to parasites. Um, an external parasite control program as well is important. This is one of those things that you treat when you get it. If there's an issue that you might have, you can um, treat for it, but it's important to treat for it because they can, uh, external parasites can really reduce production and they can be kind of a, a problem to get rid of if you don't um, notice it and treat it as it comes along. So one example is lice. And so if the animals are constantly picking at their bodies and losing hair and they start to get lesions and losing milk, or sorry, losing weight and milk production, um, these are times where you need to really think about doing something about those external parasites. Uh, it can definitely be more of a challenge um, in the winter or when the animals are more stressed because the lice are trying to find somewhere to, to set up shop for the winter. Um, one of the things you can do is get those animals in better body condition. They can handle those parasites a little better. Um, treat them with anthelmintics. And then of course, if you have some that are really bad, maybe try quarantine, quarantining them um, to get rid of the, the problem. And then um, you can see there on the right hand side, there's a handful of other things that might affect your animals uh, that you could treat for. And Anytime you have any type of parasite, whether it's internal or external, it can definitely lead to secondary uh, problems and infections. So you've got your preventative protocols, which would be vaccines and internal and external uh, parasite control. Um, but you also want to have a treatment protocol um, as part of your infectious disease control uh, program. So you want to identify any sort of treatments or antibiotics that you might need to have on hand and work with your veterinarian to make sure that you have the right um, treatment for the right problem and uh, read labels and treat appropriately. So for example, um, make sure that your injections make it all the way into the animal. So you know how easy it is sometimes to give an injection that might go straight through and the animal doesn't get it. So make sure you're um, giving those injections properly. And if the program is seven days, make sure you give seven days of, of antibiotic so that they get everything that they need to be able to um, fight the disease. Also have other uh, equ equipment and um, health materials that you may need. So bandaging materials. If you are comfortable doing um, suturing and surgical uh, procedures on your animals. Make sure you have your latex gloves, extra syringes and needles, disinfectants and antimicrobial scrubs so that you can make sure you're doing it in a clean way. Gauze or cotton to uh, scrub the, the area. And treat in a strategic order. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but make sure that when you're um, treating your animals, you work with your lambs first and then your, the rest of your herd and then hit the sick pen. And then once you're done with the sick pen, go clean your boots and change your clothes and wash them so that you don't spread any disease to your healthy animals and especially the young animals. Um, just a quick reminder about injection, effect, in, injection effectiveness. Um, make sure that you're using that proper injection technique. So if the label says subcutaneous or intramuscular or intravenously, make sure that you inject based on those. Uh, properly. And you need to make sure that you have the proper needle size. Obviously, the smaller that you can use for the type of treatment, the better. And then replace needles 
when um, they're dull or bent, so we can see here in this photo, this barbed needle is gonna be kind of painful going in. Um, you never wanna use a needle um, on an animal that you wouldn't stick into yourself, is my rule of thumb. Also, don't put a dirty needle into your bottle of antibiotic or vaccine. Um, and then if you wanna get really down to the best biosecurity practice, change needles between animals, but that's not always practical. So um, just make sure that you're um, using the, the best that you can do. And of course, when you're giving a sub-Q or an intermuscular injection, you wanna use this triangle in the neck area um, because that is the least amount of meat that you can uh, cause problems to. That's a great spot to give injections. And you never want to have something like up in this top corner. This was a roast that um, I found in a forum. Somebody had purchased this ro roast and was getting ready to cook it for uh, whether it was a restaurant or whatever it was, but they found this um, abscess in, in the roast. And we don't ever want to have our animals be the one that they find looking like that. So just something to consider. The other thing that you can do to make sure that your animals are, are healthy is to test for diseases. So there's a couple of screens that you can do with sheep and goats. One is the biosecurity screen. Um, that gives you a handful of different, um, and I have to remember which ones were included in that. I think CLA, OPP, um, Yoni's disease, and one other one. But anyway, you can uh, do a blood serum test to get an answer to those four um, infectious diseases. Um, you can also do abortion screens. So if you're having issues with um, lambs and kids being aborted, you can send um, placenta samples, aborted fetuses, um, vaginal swabs, blood, and those will help you get an answer to why your animals are aborting um, before full term. Um, you can pull samples during a necropsy from a euthanized or a dead animal to send in for testing as well. And I'm sure that there's a handful of pathology labs. Um, your veterinarian can help you send samples as well. Um, and the big thing is, is if you're going to collect samples yourself, make sure that you have that personal protection um, so that you don't catch whatever killed your animals. Um, culling animals, I talked a lot about this in a couple weeks ago in my webinar about um, culling for genetic improvement, but the big thing is, is any kind of animal that's not doing well consistently, like this you over here, if you have a you that looks skinny all the time and just really is a poor doer, um, it could be a number of reasons, right? But she doesn't need to be one that you keep in your herd. So poor performance is one. If you have something wrong with somebody genetically, make sure you get rid of them because that just lives on in your flock if you keep breeding that you or that doe. Um, if they are constantly needing to be treated for parasites, um, if they have a disease that you know they have, um, if they're just generally poor doers, make sure you get rid of them. They're not worth having around and they're passing this down to their offspring. Um, and you want to make sure that you dispose of all the dead animals that you have by state laws and also with biosecurity in mind. So if you have animals that are dying of some kind of infectious disease, don't just put them in a dead pile where your other animals can um, find them. So bury, burn, take them to the dump, whatever it may be, um, but make sure you dispose of those animals correctly. <clears throat> as far as uh, necropsy, this is a great way to identify why an animal um, obviously died, um, but it gives you a, a chance to find out if there's anything infectious that you need to worry about. And usually it costs less to have a necropsy done than it is the loss of several or even one more animal. So to me, it's worth it, especially if you have something suspicious happen. Um, so. If you have animals dying of an infectious disease, this is um, pretty critical in being able to manage and treat um, any sort of disease that may be going through your 
heard and a lot of times there are um, diseases as we go through the diseases you'll see that there are a lot of them you don't know by just looking at the animal um, so once they're dead having that necropsy done is important so again when you're if you're going to perform the necropsy yourself i would recommend at least spending some time with your vet to make sure that you understand what normal looks like inside of your animals so you can uh, identify where issues may lie also to identify the best way to take tissue samples. Um, and I think if you're working closely with your vet, that will help you um, be able to identify these things and send samples for testing. So another really important piece of biosecurity is disinfection and sterilization. So make sure that every piece of equipment that you ever use on any animal that you're um, making sure that you wash it up and get it nice and clean before you use it. Um, after you use it as well, but especially before you use it. So um, for example, one that might get overlooked at times is hoof trimmers and shears. Uh, make sure that you wash those and disinfect them um, between uses because um, those are good, great ways to spread disease if you don't. Um, and then the obvious ones, if you're pulling lambs or kids, tubing anything, um, boots is one that gets overlooked quite a bit. In fact, it's one that I have to regularly think about to make sure that I'm always getting my boots scrubbed between sick animals and healthy ones and across farms. So if I go see somebody else's farm, I make sure that I disinfect my boots in between. Um, so you can use chlorhexidine, beta diner bleach to do this. Um, and you also want to make sure you're washing all of your clothing and your gloves and other things um, between especially your sick animals and your healthy ones. Um, use latex gloves and just throw them away. Um, wash your hands. Uh, sterilize surgical tools. Don't be cutting on animals with possible uh, germ-ridden tools. And make sure you muck your stalls and clean bedding between animals and one that I overlook all the time too is scrubbing those fence panels and the trailers between new arrivals, sick animals, hauling of my regular flock. Um, keeping records is super important because you want to make sure this primarily, especially with withdrawal periods, this is by law something that you have to do if you're selling animals. So if you uh, give any of your animals vaccines, treatments of any kind, anthelmintics, make sure that you're writing down the date that you administered it and which animals got it so that if you go to sell an animal, you make sure that you have that withdrawal period taken care of before slaughter, especially. Um, keeping track of any disease testing that you've done or necropsy records is really important, especially if you're coming down with something consistently, it'll help you understand when it started, what you've done to prevent it, your management, um, that type of thing. Record where you get new animals from so that you can go back to them if something happens and make sure that they um, either know that that's happening to animals that you purchased from them or, or find out any information they have. Keep track of any animal death and causes, necropsy results, test results. Fetal losses are really important. Don't just discount um, a late-term abortion. Make sure that you understand why it happened. Reproductive import performance is also important to take note of because if your animals are just not breeding up very well, you could have something else going on. And keep track of what you've been feeding your animals. Um, these all tie into making sure that you're doing the best you can and having a really good um, infectious disease control program among other pieces of production. So again, I'm gonna hit on nutrition. Nutrition is hugely important to disease. Most diseases are related to nutrition. And if your animal is in poor body condition, they're not going to be able to survive or fight the disease nearly as well as, you know, this top picture, heavy, well-conditioned animal versus the skinny, poor doer. Obviously, this girl is gonna do much better than this one when she's exposed to disease. So this is really important and I hope you guys, as I continue to constantly tell you about it, that you will think about the different life stages that your animals are in throughout the year and make sure that you're meeting all of their nutritional needs 
because that's going to really affect your bottom line, your production, and your health status of your animals. So um, I'm happy to work with all of you individually if that's what it takes. Just go ahead and reach out to me and we'll make sure that your animals are getting fed the way they need to. But we just want to give them the best chance that they can to fight disease um, and, and not have that secondary infection risk and passing down to their offspring and, and all of that. And again, we'll go back to the stress. Um, make sure that you have your vaccin vaccination protocols linked up with where you may have stressful events. And so, for example, lambing and kidding is stressful. Weaning is stressful. Anytime that you work the animals, transport the animals, um, winter in and of itself can be stressful because it's cold and miserable. So just make sure you're linking up all of these things with different types of life events that are happening. Make sure you're providing them the best life style that you can, air, water, feed, and housing. Um, and that's gonna help a lot with disease management as well. So going back to the boots, this is again where people, and including myself, I'm guilty of this time and time again, but if you're gonna go see the neighbor and help them work their animals, have a different pair of boots. Make sure you're scrubbing them down with um, betadine or bleach or whatever it is. And the biggest thing with those is if you apply um, any sort of disinfectant, let it kind of suds up and sit because the longer the time that it's in contact with the bacteria or the microbials, um, the better. So let them suds up and sit for five or 10 minutes and then scrub them off. Um, but you really wanna be careful about tracking your problems to the neighbor and your neighbor's problems back to yourself. Think about getting in and out of your vehicle. Um, if you get in with boots from the neighbor's house, you put it on your floorboard and then every time you get into your truck, you're gonna have access to that again on your boots, right? Um, the other thing is something that's really, something I don't think about a lot either is take a different pair of boots to town because every rancher in the whole area goes into that feed store with boots from their production system, right? And so it's just something to think about. It's really easy to pick up um, nasty things that spread. And, and as you know, if the sheep and goats can spread their diseases to us, we can also spread our diseases to them. And so even just going to town at the grocery store, you could pick up something that you'll give your animals and that's um, never fun. So, so um, I'm gonna finish up our conversation here with some discussion about the different types of infectious diseases that we see in sheep and goats. But I wanna make a disclaimer at the beginning, I'm not a veterinarian, so I don't have all the answers to these. And when in doubt, make sure that you have that veterinarian um, relationship that you can call them, have them out, have them help you with your disease control program. And um, that's just the best way to make sure that you're doing everything right. So the first one that I'll talk about, and I should probably just point out here on the top right, I have a box that says biosecurity, which means do I need to worry about all the things we just talked about? Um, making sure that um, you address all of the different biosecurity. And most of them that I'm going to talk about will be checked yes. Zoonotic means does it transfer to humans from these animals or vice versa? And some will say yes, some will say no, but that'll give you an idea there. And inapparent carriers meaning that an animal can have the disease and you can't tell visually. So um, in this case, yes, Rusella ovis is, you need biosecurity to get rid of it, maintain it, manage it, um, and you have yes in apparent carriers. So um, Rusella ovis is one that's primarily found in uh, the males, and it'll cause epididymitis. It causes poor fertility, and it is sexually transmitted. And so if you have a ram that you turn out with your ewes, and he has this, your ewes can give it to other rams. Um, and what ends up happening is they can't breed. So um, they're just a useless animal in your breeding uh, stock. Um, 
So for ewes, it most commonly just delays conception when they contract it for one or two heat cycles. So at the end of the day, you may be a month or two late um, having lambs. And persistent infections can cause those late term abortions. So this is one of the ones that if you're having abortions, this could be the cause. Um, the way that you can test is palpation of the testicles. Here on the right, you can see one of these testicles is starting to have an abnormal shape to it. And then you can also take a blood test um, and send it in to be able to know for sure. This is one that you really should have done before you even purchase any sort of um, rams into your flock. Um, Q fever is one that actually when I was in grad school, the University of Wyoming dealt with um, in the sheep flock there. And it was very, very zoonotic. It's one that um, it, it's especially bad for anybody with lowered immune function, um, heart, um, heart disease, or somebody who's pregnant. So this is one that you have to be really careful of. Um, it causes late-term abortions and stillbirths. It's primarily when it hits, it's going to hit your entire flock. Um, it's spread through birthing fluids, placentas. Uh, it can be passed down to offspring from colostrum and milk. You can just inhale it or ingest the bacteria, so it's super, super contagious. Um, if you have several fetuses that are aborted, I would recommend getting a blood sample. I think this is one of the ones in the biosecurity panel. Take a blood sample and get it out the door immediately. If you confirm Q fever in your flock, treat all the remaining pregnant ewes with tetracycline. And you wanna be sure to take extra care when um, removing any dead animals and quarantine infected animals. This is one that if you can get them tested prior to purchase, it's really, really bad to have it in your, in your uh, flock. So there's several other abortive diseases that happen um, in sheep and goats. Chlamydiosis, Campylobacteriosis, Toxoplasmosis, Salmonellosis, Listeriosis, Leptospirosis. These are all um, abortive causing uh, diseases. They do, for the most part, pass to and from humans. And most of the time, you do not know that you have the problem until you start seeing abortions occurring. Um, the biggest challenge is that all of these um, causes of abortions can also be very similar to nutritional abortions, meaning that the animals um, have some kind of pregnancy toxemia, or maybe they're just not having enough uh, a high enough nutritional plane to be able to uh, gestate the lambs and kids fully. And so this is one where you should take a vaginal swab, a blood sample, placenta uh, sample, aborted fetus, and get those in for a necropsy. And if you find out that you have any of these things, um, for the most part, there's uh, vaccines that you can give your animals for it. Another one that we have to think about is mastitis. This can be um, very infectious across animals if not taken care of. Um, so it causes inflammation um, in your mammary glands and um, it's really painful, swollen. The animals can't feed the, the uh, offspring and it gives you know, they get a high fever, they can go off feed, it can cause a lot of depression, and sometimes it can get bad enough that it causes death in animals. Um, sometimes you won't see symptoms until next year they have the hard bag, which is scar tissue. Um, and so, but at that point, once the bag is hard, they may or may not have any milk coming from that half or whatever. Um, and so these are really important to take notice of and treat so that you don't have issues year after year. Uh, make sure that especially when you're helping um, a lamb or a kid suckle or whatever, make sure you have good sanitation. If you do start seeing a lot of infection, um, you, there are some uh, 
um, vaccines for some of these as well. So this slide is primarily diseases for lambs, the bacterial infections that they can get. Um, a lot of them have vaccines. So if you start seeing clostridial infections or um, respiratory infections in your lambs and kids, you can start vaccinating for specific things if you do some testing and figure out what it is that you're having problems with. Um, diarrheal causing infections are really hard to um, diagnose and a lot of times there are no vaccines so it's um, management issue but make sure that you're having clean pens and bedding and and doing good nutritional management and providing some kind of chlorhexidine or iodine um, on the navel when they're born um, not keeping sick lambs and kids with other lambs and kids, that type of thing. This is a place where quarantine and management is really important. Um, scrapie is one that we don't see a lot of anymore, but it is something that can be a problem. It's, it's a prion protein that causes um, encephalopathy, which is of course an issue with the brain. Um, it spreads with direct contact and usually symptoms don't appear for two to five years after they're infected. Um, it's very slow progressing and it's deterioration of central nervous system and it causes all kinds of weird stuff, tremors, uncoordination, head pressing, stargazing, weight loss, um, issues with biting at the wool, um, scratching, uh, and usually within a few months it's caused the animal to die. So you wanna make sure that when you're purchasing animals, you purchase from sources that are five or more years clean, or they're part of the voluntary scrapie flock certification program. Yoni's disease is another one that I think is included in the panel if you were to do a biosecurity panel on your sheep. Um, it's an intestinal disease that's chronic and it's slow to develop. So of course you start to see animals just looking poorly. Their skin is kind of flaky and they get a little bit loose in the stool. Um, it's often by the time you identify the issue, it's widespread throughout the whole herd and it transfers through feces and milk um, and possibly um, in the fetus itself. So in this case, you can do a fecal smear and a blood test. And most of the time people recommend that you do both so that you don't have any um, uh, false positives or false negatives. Caseous lymphadenitis or CLA is what most people know it by. Um, this is when you have those enlarged lymph nodes and abscesses throughout the body. So Goats are the ones that you'll see a lot of abscesses on the outside of the body. Sheep, um, a lot of times, may only have internal lesions, so you don't see it until it's until the animal has died. This is where having um, necropsy on dead animals can be really important to identifying the problem. This one does have a vaccine available, and if you start vaccinating your young animals that maybe haven't been exposed yet, and you and you cull animals that have visual um, abscesses on their bodies, you can usually be able to move through the problem pretty within a few years. Um, so you can test the abscess contents or do a blood test to identify whether or not your animals have this one. Ovine progressive pneumonia or OPP, which is primarily found in sheep, is a slowly progressing uh, retroviral disease. Usually the animals are two to four years old when you start to see symptoms, but all kinds of random things can happen with this one. Um, the only way that you can tell if they have OPP specifically is through blood testing, um, but there's no treatment, so you have to uh, work with this disease through culling and management. So the similar one that's found in goats is the Caprin arthritis encephalitis virus or CAEV. So this one's transmitted through colostrum or through blood. It's the most common in dairy goats and it comes in different forms. Arthritis, 
encephalitis, which is the, the brain um, type of issues, pneumonia, mastitis, or chronic, chronic wasting. Um, the most common that you'll see is the arthritis. So it's usually the adult animals and kids that are more than six months years old, and they start to kind of get lame and stiff. They don't want to move normally, swollen joints. They lose weight, or they can have the encephalitis, which is the younger kids. It causes incoordination, um, progressive paralysis, depression, blindness, head tilt, seizures, and death. Um, the problem with this is they can test negative um, and it is stress activated. So um, I think if you uh, make sure that if you see any sort of um, symptoms like this, make sure you get those blood tests um, and do some culling as well. Sore mouth is one that while it is not deadly, it is very nasty. It's a pox virus that's um, in sheep and goats. It's sore mouth or ORF is another name for it. It's very, very contagious. So if your animals have this, make sure you do not touch anything with your bare skin. Um, it causes lesions around the nose and mouth, eyelids, vulva, teats and feet. And so what ends up happening is the lambs get, the lambs and kids get um, obviously a sore mouth and it's very painful. It will clear up on its own, but if the ewes and does get it on their teats, it can cause issues for the animals to be able to suckle on both ends, the sore mouth or the sore teats. Um, there is a live vaccine available. So if this pops up in your herd, you can vaccinate for it, but you do not want to vaccinate for it until you see it pop up in your herd because it will introduce it to um, the animals if you vaccinate prior to exposure. And um, when you do need to start vaccinating, you want to do the lambs early within a few days of being born. Um, and then you can do them later on if it's not a very severe case, but it's not very effective in adults. Foot rot is one that if you have a problem with this, um, it can be really painful for the sheep and goats. Uh, it's caused by two different bacteria that come together um, to cause this infection. Um, a lot of times what happens is the foot will get injured in some way and then the bacteria will start to um, opportunistically cause infection within that injury. Um, and it's also one that happens a lot when the feet get really long. It can grow in those areas. Um, and some breeds are more susceptible than others. For example, merinos are really susceptible to um, foot rot. So you can trim. Um, give them antibiotics, and do a foot bath of some kind. Uh, there's three options that I've listed there, 10% copper sulfate, 10% zinc sulfate, or 5% formalin. You wanna combine all the methods, the trimming, the antibiotics, and the antiseptics. And also with sheep, remember that sheep can easily um, have copper toxicity, so that may be not your best option if you're doing it with sheep. But if you give a foot bath to animals with um, foot rot for five to 15 minutes, and it was variable in my research, so that's why the, the difference there, but if it were me, I would give it to them longer if possible, and then repeat that a week later. If you move your animals through a foot bath daily for 30 days, when you have it throughout the whole herd, um, that's a way to help sort of decrease the prevalence there. And there are vaccines available. So if this is something that you're having trouble with regularly, you can work with your veterinarian to get a hold of that vaccine. Also, wet ground, of course, exacerbates this problem. So pink eye is one that we um, deal with in sheep and goats. And of course, it's one that if they get it, it's made worse by anything that is in and around the eyeball, including insects, dust, wind, direct sunlight, if the eye is injured, other infections. Um, it's spread by flies um, between animals and on other surfaces. So this is one where you see if you've got animals with pink eye grazing and they rub their eye on other grasses and, and they can transfer it that way as well. You can treat it with antibiotics and eye ointments, but there are no vaccines available for sheep, for uh, sheep or goats for pink eye. 
Um, ringworm is one that I just wanted to mention because even though it's not deadly and it probably isn't going to cause any problems, it's extremely contagious. So it's just one that you want to try to make sure that you're staying on top of when you see it in your herd. Um, it transfers between animals and of course almost everyone in the world that I know has that raises animals has gotten it themselves from the animals and so um, it's just one that if you can get rid of it that's great. Um, you can treat it with chlorhexidine, uh, topical iodine compounds, or there's a plant fungicide called Captain. Um, and of course, anytime you can expose a fungal infection to sunlight, that'll help as well. So I guess with that, that's all I have for you guys. Um, I hope that I just helped you think about some things within your um, system to help decrease prevalence of infectious disease. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat box. And um, aside from that, I really appreciate you guys joining, and we will see you next week. Um, same time, same place. All right, thanks, guys.